Well, as Amy said, I'm George Turner. Um, I'm an astronomer by training. Uh, I did that for about 13 years and then I got to looking at my retirement account and I decided I had to do something to provide for my retirement so I got into research computing and I've been doing this now for 22 years. So um, I grew up in a little town, Versailles, if you ever watch the weather around here you'll see it off to the left side of the of the map. So UC is very much a hometown institution and I like to say I got a lot of cousins that go to school here. So um, I've been volunteering my time uh, with the research technologies groups here uh, for about three years. Uh, this started off as a hallway conversation and um, it's been an ongoing collaboration since. So the goal today is to um, get you familiarized with the cluster uh, that they have on campus. I'll go into a little bit of the history here in a, in a bit and um, try to get um, uh, uh, get you running some jobs on the system. So again, as Amy said, this is a very small group. If you have questions or trouble, just let us know, speak up. Uh, I want this to be a two-way conversation. Now there's a lot of content in these slides that uh, some of it I'll just sort of breeze over. It's meant for you to come back and reference later. Um, there's a text file with a lot of this information in a text file. Um, I should uh, mention that I assume that you have some concept of uh, operating in Linux and when I say a text file you know what I'm talking about. Um, if you're not, ask. Um, the, these exercises is meant to be cut and paste because if you're sitting there trying to type in all of this stuff, um, if you're like me, I can't type, you know, without six typos in five letters. So, um, so that's why there's this ASCII text file out there. Um, Amy will have a copy of the slides posted on your repository. Um, and there's actually a PDF of the slides in this directory that we're going to copy. So with that, let me get started. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, again, just repeating some of this stuff, this is an introductory tutorial. Um, we're going to log into the system. It sounds like some of you already have accounts and have probably already logged in. Uh, if you're having trouble, just raise a hand and Andrew or um, uh, Larry or somebody will be there to help you. Um, the first thing to do is to log into the system. You'll log in as using your 6 plus 2 uh, username at uh, arc2.uc.edu. Um, and while you're doing that, uh, just some quick terms. Uh, ARC is the Advanced Research Computing Group. This is the group that Amy uh, has been talking about. ARC with a second C is the Advanced Research Computing Clusters. Um, storage, um, this is just like on your laptop. There's home directories, there's scratch workspace um, where this is usually not backed up. Project space, archive space. Um, today we're really only going to be working with the home directories. Um, networks, uh, what makes a supercomputer a supercomputer is that when we buy these systems, we go out and we buy the best uh, high performance computer that you could buy at Best Buy. It's the same CPU, the memory and things. What makes it a supercomputer is the network on the back end of it, okay? Um, there's a, um, what we call a high speed, low latency network. The idea, no matter what you're doing in research computing, you're dealing with two properties, either bandwidth or latency. Now this could be the bandwidth from memory to the CPU, or it could be the bandwidth between one CPU and another, or the, uh, the latency, which is essentially when I request a chunk of memory, how long does it take for that request to go out and for it to come back? Or if I'm sending a message from one computer to another, um, what's the latency of the message uh, of sending a zero length message? So no matter what you're doing in research computing, you're always battling with those two issues, bandwidth and latency. So anyways, the supercomputer has a low latency, uh, high bandwidth switch or network on the back end. And what 
um, we're going to run an MPI program. Uh, MPI is Message Passing Interface. And the idea is that um, your program is too big to run in one computer, so we want to run it in two computers. So what you're actually doing is splitting up the memory on, uh, between these two um, computers. And if one computer needs the memory uh, that another one has, you have to send a, a message. Okay, so this is the message passing interface and it goes across this network. Slurm is the resource manager that we will be doing, using. Um, the resources are the computes on the back side. Uh, the resources have resources within them like CPUs, memory, disk. Uh, they could have things like licenses or GPUs. So when you make a request to the resource manager, you're telling it that I need these types of resources, find them and schedule my job uh, on the resources when they become available. SSH, we probably already use that today. Um, for those that are just showing up, um, uh, we would like you to log in to the ARC2. Uh, username is your UC6 plus 2. And at ARC2, well, ARC with two C's, uc.edu. And this is very informal. If you have questions or comments, please speak up. And uh, if you're having problems, raise a hand and somebody here will be able to help you. Um, anytime you see this hashtag, that's a comment in Linux. Anything after that is not interpreted. So you will see on my slides and things today, I will have like a hashtag and I'll have some little note or reference uh, about what um, I'm trying to, to accomplish. Uh, STD in, STD out, and STD error, that's standard in. This is the input from, could be from your keypad. You could have put your information into a text file and you're piping it into a program. Uh, STD out is the output that you see on your screen or maybe you're piping that into a file. And STD error is where error messages go. And path is um, in Linux, in Unix. Path is a, a list of directories where executables could be, um, and you just type in the name of, ex of the executable and it'll start running. So I believe that's all the terms I have. Um, this is for a reference for later, as I said. There's a bunch of stuff in here I'm just going to breeze over. Uh, if you need uh, some introductory tutorials for uh, Linux or Bash, uh, there's some here. There's some references for uh, high performance computing systems. Uh, Slurm, there's a lot out there on uh, Slurm. So hopefully I'm just going to whet your appetite today and you can do some further readings uh, and research and find a lot more information out there on the internet. A uh, little history on the um, ARC project. Uh, again, most of this is for reference. Uh, you can come back and look at it later on. but. Uh, like I said, I've been involved with it for about three years now. Um, it was actually Amy and Jane were working on this for a couple of years before that. So it's five plus years, probably going on six now. Um, we've had, uh, I saw Kurt come in. Raise your hand, Kurt. Uh, Kurt's the sysadmin, so um, he along with Andrew, if you uh, submit a ticket or something, these are the two guys that are going to behind the scenes that are going to be working on this. Uh, Larry, as Amy introduced, um, he um, has been a driving force be uh, behind this project. <laughs> uh, so um, it, takes, uh, it takes a village to do this. So uh, there's a lot of people out there to help you. If you need it, feel free to, um, uh, to reach out. Again, more, this is more uh, for reference uh, for later on. We started with the ARC-1. Uh, it was actually uh, the vice president for research uh, bought some, Professor uh, Prashant Kari, uh, more or less donated his startup cluster. Uh, this was the ARC one that was originally out there. These are the details on uh, what uh, goes, has gone into that cluster. That, um, that got us up and running. Right now we're building out the ARC 2. That's the system that we will be using today. Um, ARC2 is our first production cluster and um, uh, it's a um, it's a uh, under construction so um, please excuse our dust. 
Uh, it's made up, of, the ARC-2 is made up of AMD processors. We started with the ROMs. We were hoping to get some Milans, but I'm sure you've all read in, or heard in, in the press about the chip shortages. Um, and uh, acquiring the Milan chips is rather difficult. We'll have about one and a half petabytes of storage coming online here real soon. Um, additional compute resources will probably be available by the end of the year. So again, stay tuned. Um, watch your email for the, the uh, newsletters. These are some basic commands. Uh, again, I'm just sort of putting these in here for reference. If you want to come back later on, we will be doing a lot of these commands today. Um, uh, editors. Um, again, I'm assuming you have some basic introduction to Unix or Linux. Uh, we'll be working with text files. These are two editors that are rather popular on Linux. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned Emacs. Yes, I do. Um, Emacs is a whole universe in and to itself. It's actually a Lisp, in, Lisp interpreter, L-I-S-P. Um, and if you ever get into Emacs, um, I would recommend loading the um, Ezra uh, module. It's, an it's a first stab at artificial intelligence from the late 50s, I believe. And it's only... 50 lines of code maybe and you start talking to it and it's um, it acts like a therapist and it'll uh, it, it, it's scary when you first see it so uh, in the modern world uh, we work a lot of people work with GUI editors uh, two popular ones are gedit and edit um, I like nedit I've been using it actually for about 30 30 years now um, and the nice thing about it is that you can cut and paste columns so in the research field, when you got columns of data, this is a, a handy one to have. Um, SLURM, there's actually what it stands for. Simple Linux Utility for Resource Management. I described it briefly earlier. I won't go into the history. Again, it's, uh, it's here for reference if you want to come back and look at it. Um, scheduling is rather important. And uh, I'm going to go into uh, quite a bit on it. Um, originally, you just had FIFO schedulers. So the first person that submitted a job, it would run first. And everybody else that submitted a job later on would have to wait for the first job to get done. As time went on, things have gotten more sophisticated. These days, we use uh, fair share as pretty much the um, uh, Everybody's using a fair share scheduler. Essentially, you have a bank of, of um, something of value. Um, and the more you use the resource, the more you use up that bank. Okay, so and the idea is that um, the more you, if somebody comes along that hasn't been using the cluster very much, their job will run sooner than yours. Okay, so what has a ha tendency to happen is that um, you will have uh, a cluster and um, it will be mostly filled up. In the old days we used to think if we could get a cluster 80% full we were running successfully. With modern schedulers we can get that up over 90%. So um, what the scheduler is doing and one of the things I want to emphasize is that when it's very important you, for you to be able to predict how long your jobs are going to run. Okay, now when you first start up, you're not going to know this. So, but after you, the more you run your jobs, you're going to get a feel for like, well, this takes 10 hours to run, or this takes two weeks to run, or whatever. So that, knowing that how long that's going to run is very valuable for the scheduler, because what it's doing is making predictions. If you just put in the maximum time, then the scheduler thinks, well, I'm going to run for two weeks or 20 days or whatever it is. And so it's not able to do accurate predictions when it can fill in other jobs. So what's happening is, is that your cluster is maybe, say, 90% full. And then it starts predicting, okay, this is the next job I'm going to run. And it needs, say, 20 nodes for three days. So what it does is it starts reserving back the 20 nodes that it's going to need to run that job. Well, while those jobs are, or those nodes are sitting there idle. 
and then you can do backfill scheduling so if you have small jobs and you've accurately predicted say like my job only runs for an hour it'll start backfilling these little jobs in there so when you look at the at the uh, scheduler or at the system you may see well hey well this user is running hundreds of jobs and I've been setting in the cluster now for for three days and I have it run why are they running more than likely it's backfill these little jobs are able to run in there and jump in there so it's very important for you to predict either how long your uh, jobs are going to run or how short um, and then expansion this is um, just what this allows is that a small job that has been setting in the cluster for a long time will start getting added priority to it because you don't want a job that's going to run for one hour to set in the cluster for a week okay so expansion is a tool that the sysadmins and the facilitators use to um, uh, to make sure that uh, these small jobs get run I've explained fair share um, if you want to come and look at this graphically later on, I'll leave it in there. But again, it's just the more you use the system, the lower your dispatch priority is going to be. So um, are there really any questions on that? I'm just going to blow through this then. Okay. As you as a user, your tool for interacting with the cluster is the Slurm Resource Manager. And these are the tools that you're going to be using. So there's two main ones, S Allocate and S Batch. They're slightly different. S Allocate says I want to allocate some number of resources for some length of time. Okay, so maybe I just do serial program. I don't do this complicated message, message passing programming. And I just need one node, or I don't even, I just need half a node. I need 10 cores for the next hour, because I'm going to go to lunch here shortly. Okay, so what S Allocate allows you to do is essentially interactively act with your, these resources. You can reserve them, you can run jobs in and out, and those resources will set there uh, available to you. S Batch is a little different in that you create a batch script. And when I say a batch script, this is one of these ASCII text files that has bash commands in it. So it's gonna have like CD into this directory, um, run this program, copy this file from here to there. So these are just the bash skill uh, commands that you would be doing interactively, but you put them into a text file um, for them to run on their own. S run works with both S allocate and S batch. Now, if you're only using uh, one node, you're not doing the complicated um, multiple node message passing type programming, you don't necessarily need S run. But what S run will do is run a command on all of the resources that you have available. Okay? Now, there's parameters you can run or put on the S run command. Say I have four nodes allocated, but I only want to run this command on two. I can say like s run dash nodes equals two, and then give me the date or something. Um, and then sq, this is the command. You're going to you're going to submit it, uh, an s batch job, and it'll be setting in the queue, and then you're going to do sq to see what's the status, how many other jobs are in the queue, uh, things like this. So. These will be your screwdrivers and pliers of the tools you're going to be using. Um, I, when I was talking about um, the fair share uh, scheduling, uh, you have the S prio. Um, what's your job priority? Uh, you'll. This is the command you're going to use. Is like, well, I've been sitting in the queue for three hours. Why hasn't my job started running? Um, S info gives you an overview of the whole system, how many nodes are in use, what's available. Uh, S cancel, I submitted a job and like, oh, I've got new information, I want to change the input file, I don't want to run the, the data I had. So this is a, how you can cancel a job once you've already submitted. S attach. Um, this is a command where you've actually allocated, say, a group of nodes and um, I want to attach, uh, 
I mentioned STDN earlier, so I want to attach my keyboard to a, a job that's running out there on the back end. So you would use S attach, or maybe you want to change the output file, something like this. And then S um, Bcast, broadcast. I have six nodes out there allocated to a job, and I want to copy this file to all six nodes, maybe the temp directory on, that ho on those hosts. Uh, this is how to copy a file to all the nodes that have been allocated to your job. Um, okay, is everybody logged in? This is the interactive portion of the show. Um, at some point, I'm going to jump off of the slides and uh, try to actually do these commands. Um, a colleague once said that um, never preface a live demo with anything more uh, predictive than watch this. So um, watch this. So um, there was a So the first four commands up there at the top where we're setting up the environment. Um, the environment is doing things like modifying the path that I mentioned before. So when you do these module uh, avail, this is showing you what modules are available on the system. This is just more or less informational. Module spider is essentially uh, a similar. Now the next, uh, the third command there, module load, this is going to load the GCC compiler and the MPI environments. So, excuse me, and then we'll do the module list command and this will tell you whether um, everything has worked successfully. For those proceeding on, um, there's the cp-rp command. All of the commands that we're doing today are in this file. So if you copy that over, you can start doing this cut, cut and paste that I was talking about. Note that there's a space between the two. This is the input file you're copying. This is where you want it to go. That period is the current directory. Once you copy it over, you can CD, that's change directory, into that directory that you've just copied over. And then do an LS, that'll show you a list of all the files in that directory. The dash RP on the copy command is for recursively do the copy and maintain the permissions. That's things like dates, permissions on the file, things like that. I assume most of you have successfully done this. Okay. So there's a file in there called simple.c. We want to look at the contents of that file. We're going to use the command less, uh, less space simple.c. This will allow you to see the contents of that file. I should let me, oops. Work. 
If you're watching what I'm typing, you'll notice I type in a couple letters and what I'm doing is hitting the tab key and it does the autocomplete for me. I'm a lazy typist. So, uh, where is it? So there I just typed in CD space FD and I hit the tab key and it does autocomplete. If I was to have two files, say like I had FDW dash and then two different names, uh, the bell will ring on your, and then you just need to type one or two more letters, hit tab again and then it'll autocomplete. So, um, Cat simple. Actually, I said do less, didn't I? So this is the world's smallest C program. You cannot make a C program with less characters than this. So main is essentially an entry point. When you once you compile this, you're going to create a binary. Um, when you run that binary, what's happening is the operating system takes and loads it into memory. This main is the address of the entry point for that program. And you, you load, the, the operating system is going to load what's called the program counter with the address of that starting point. Okay, and then uh, that program will run till it gets to the end and that's the address of that right curly bracket which will when is actually just the next instruction or in the next memory cell for this program so it's going to load the program it'll jump to the beginning of the program it will run to the end and it will exit and so it's essentially taking up two memory cells is all it's going to take so to get out of this i hit q I'm um, going backwards. We're going to do the GCC dash O is out. Um, so I want the output of this compile to be simple. Um, and I'm going to have the input file be simple.c. Um, then the dot slash simple runs. So it's what I described earlier. Um, uh, that's what's going to happen. Oh, I didn't do my. Um, while I'm here, um, you can see that AAA README. That's the file that has all of these commands in it. So, what I'm doing now is I'm highlighting, I'm going to copy and paste all these commands. This which command is not in there, but it, this will tell me that I've successfully located it. So there's a user bin GCC. Um, it just shows me that my, um, my environment, my paths are set up and I have the GCC compiler in, the, uh, in my path. So little trick right here I compiled this all I got was my um, prompt bat but there's a way to test and see if I actually was successful oops fat fingers strike again um, dollar sign for those that are new, new to um, Unix or Linux, dollar sign means the next thing after it is a variable. So there's a variable called question mark. And this is, this is a variable that's always in your environment. And it means what was the success or what was the status of the last command I ran? So here, my last command was GCC compile. I can actually test and see if that was successful. Zero is always success. Okay, so this was not in the instructions, but I'm going to wing it on the way we're going. So, just something to learn. Now I'm going to run that program. 
Um, well, let me off before I go farther. Darn. I've been talking about the path, the environment variable. So all of these directories are in my path. Uh, one, I don't see it, but the period is not in my path, okay? So I could put the period in my path and I wouldn't have to do this, but I'm gonna do dot slash simple. Um, and that just means run the program simple in my current directory. I could have two simple programs out there in different directories and both of them in my path. This is the way to pick the one in my current directory. So what I said earlier just happened. We loaded the starting address, we loaded the program into memory, we loaded the pro program counter with the starting address, we ran to the end of the program and we exited it. And did it run successfully? There go. Dollar question mark. Oops, there was an error. I don't know what it means. As I said, watch this, okay? Nothing more predictive than watch this. It did work though. Um, so moving on, unless there are questions or comments, again, please feel free to interrupt. Um, we're gonna do something a little more sophisticated. It seems like Hello uh, World is usually the um, first program anybody ever learns to do, no matter what the language is. So um, doing that. Another thing, I can hit the up arrow and get the last command. Scroll back. So now we're going to look at the Hello program. A little bit about MPI programming. So I described what it does in general. What I'm going to do is I got a program that's going to run on more than one node. So I had talked about the S run command, well, backing up, the S allocate and the S batch command. I can use those commands to allocate the number of resources I want. Maybe I could run, I could run the same program on one node, two nodes, 10 nodes. Okay, so um, I tell Slurm with the S allocate or S batch what resources I want. Um, when I run this program, First, we're gonna do an MPI init that just sort of in initializes some overhead for the, um, for, the, for the programs on all the different nodes. There's a MPI rank and MPI size command. This is what the, um, the size is how many nodes or how many, okay, I've talked about how many nodes I'm gonna allocate. I can also run multiple tasks per node. So size will be a multiplication of how many nodes times how many tasks per node. So this will become a little bit clearer later on. I have some exercises where you try various different numbers of nodes and, and tasks and things. But um, just think of it as I have three programs running on five nodes. So I've got 15 copies of this program running out there at the same time. And they're all talking back and forth. So I have to know, if you think about I am one of these programs running out there, I have to know which one of these 15 I am. So that's what it's doing with this MPI rank and size. I need to know how many is out there and I need to know which one I am. And then the printf command is just going to print out that information. And then uh, the MPI uh, finalizes, deconstructs all that infrastructure that the MPI init command created. So, and then here I'm returning zero. So this is I'm returning that status where I did the echo question mark, um, dollar question mark. If I wanted to return an error, say like I can't find my input file, I could say exit or um, return one. Okay, that return means something to me, whatever I put it into the program, okay? So this is how that all comes about. Q out of here. So, so 
so I did the compile. Um, uh, similar as the simple out there. Using the S allocate, I told Slurm I wanted to run two tasks. So now Slurm is out there finding me two slots to run on. More than likely it's two, two tasks will run on one node, but that's not necessarily true. Slurm's just going to find them wherever they can. So uh, S allocate tells me that it had, I mean, Slurm tells me that it was successful in that um, and um, that I'm ready to go. So then uh, I'm going to MPI run that. Copy, paste, and oh yes, um, Kurt warned me of this this morning. Um, Disregard this error. We're, we're trying to uh, figure out what this is, what this problem uh, is, but um, just disregard. This is also rather important. There's a difference between warnings and errors. Errors, something's not working. Your program did not work. A warning says that um, something wasn't right. It may work or maybe it didn't, but you need to research it further. So, um, and then you can read the messages here. But um, so this is only a warning. We're not going to about worry about warnings that we get this morning. So what, the evidence is that the program did work. Is that we have two tasks that ran out there. They ran successfully. They printed to STD out, and uh, there's the proof. So now I'm saying exit. I, Copy, paste. So I exited. With that S allocate, I'm actually not setting on the head node anymore. I'm setting out there on that node that was allocated to me. Task zero. I also had another task set in there ready for me to run. So I needed to type exit to log out from that compute resource on the back end back onto the head node. Does the concept of a head node make sense, anybody? When you log into the cluster, you're logging into a head node. Okay, and there will be a lot of other people there with you. And this is the place where you compile um, programs and look at your data files and things like that. The compute resources on the back end uh, is something else. So just so that it, that's important why um, you understand why I typed exit. Exit, uh, put another way, exit is how you log out of a system. So if I was to type exit again, I would log out of the head node and I would be setting back on my laptop, okay? So, moving on, let's see. Now we're gonna get a little more uh, complicated. Uh, take a look at the connectivity.c uh, program. As you can see, there's a lot more there. Uh, at the beginning, we always have these MPI init uh, com, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, rank and size. How big is my universe? Which one am I of them? Excuse me. Um, I do a little bit of testing here. Um, if you're programmers, I assume you understand this. Uh, if you're not, don't worry about it so much. Uh, this line here, I have commented out, excuse me. So in C, this slash star followed by a star slash, that's a comment. This is a mechanism for copying in parameters from the command line. So like on, if you think back on that simple.c command, if I had like, if I wanted to take a parameter from the command line, I would say like simple. Uh, hopefully that was not a problem. Um, anyways, it's just a way to put in parameters from the command line. Uh, a lot of researchers do parameter sweeps. So like I have a model and I want to do 
the input here is 1 through 10 or something. This is a way of putting in that, that number into the program. Um, let's see. I did get kicked out. Let me log back in. Since I'm winging it at this point in time, what I'm going to do is the grep command. That means look for this string, C-O-N-N, -N, in the README. So that just prints out all the readmes. I mean, all of the, all of the lines that have... I'm assuming I can do... How do I do cop? Is it Alt, Alt, C, copy? Copy? Yeah. Uh, if it highlights, it's copy. Oh. Yes. Alt, V, then to paste? Uh, control, control, V. Control, V. Or right click. Or right click, okay. Oh, copy. Paste. So... Oh, I got to do the module load. Uh, what I'm doing here, I'm just hitting the up arrow. What I'm doing is looking for the old module. Well, never mind. Now I'm going to run it. Uh, oh, I didn't do the S allocate. Number of tasks, time run. Okay, just type it in. Uh, did I? Oops. Okay. Uh, let's see what was I doing. When things go sideways, they go sideways. Okay, no, it did run. Uh, echo, again, I can check my status. 
Oh, but I gotta type it all the way in. That error is from the last echo. Okay. So it did. So uh, what it says is that it checked the communication. Uh, I rank zero is the main program. So it was able to uh, connect between um, uh, between the two programs. So, ooh, how do we do this? Um, can we? We only have the one input, don't we? I'm going to ask you to look at the README file or look at the PDF. So the next thing uh, in there is the, the um, I got to get out of here um, from the S allocate. So what we're doing now is we're just trying different values of, of tasks and nodes and tasks per nodes and things like that. So if you want to go ahead and do those things, if you haven't already, just go ahead because we're, we're just exploring parameter space on these different values of nodes and tasks and what does it really mean. Um, and I'll, I'll play along at home. So I'm going to allocate two nodes. And that was successful. MPI run. Yeah, we're going to have problems on the back side there. Because it should be printing all of these no error messages out. I mean, all of these communications nodes messages out. Are you guys seeing those? Of course, I've got Kurt's laptop. jumping to the bottom of the page, the two tasks per nodes on two nodes. So there it worked right. That's the kind of message you should be seeing is that for each one of those nodes and tasks you should be seeing a printed out message on each one. And what you'll notice is that uh, I was running, well, I didn't, there should be more than that. Anyways, you'll notice that I had, um, it ran on Compute 4 and on Compute 5, and that I got messages back from, what you should see is a communications between each one, each pair of all four. So you should have like eight different messages out there, and I have what, two, four, Six. So I'm missing a couple of messages here. So I mean, I and we we do have this warning. So um, moving on. Now we're going to look at the a slurm bash um, batch job. Some of the things to notice um, at the at the very top line we have a shebang. Uh, not everybody likes to use bash. There's various different shells out there. TCSH is very popular. Uh, the Max have actually gone to something called ZSH, which is very bash like. Um, and really, you can have uh, if you're a pro, pro, 
reboot. If you're a Python programmer, you could actually put the path to Python in there, and instead of having bash commands here, you could have your Python commands. Um, the next uh, two lines, well actually three lines, these are commands to the slurm. So we were putting uh, like the nodes to, task for nodes to, we were putting those on the command line. Here we're putting them into the bash uh, slurm script. If you put them in the slurm script and you put something on the com um, your uh, sbatch command, they will override whatever is here. So it's a good way to put, like I have defaults here, but when I want to do a production run, I, I change them. So uh, I think you'll find you do a lot of uh, testing and then um, to get things to work. Uh, I believe we have a debug queue, don't we? No, we don't, okay. Um, a lot of times you just want to run simple jobs. Can I get things to work? Can I get everything talking back and forth? And then once you get your uh, MPI programs and your uh, Slurm scripts working, uh, then you want to submit it to a uh, production queue. So uh, a bunch of comments I've explained before. Uh, if there's a hashtag, whatever's on that line is not um, uh, interpreted. You'll see the, um, I have given a nice example where the S batch dash O, O is almost always out. Um, and a bunch of percent X dot O, percent J, date. Um, this is a way to create output files that have the name of the bash script in them and the date. So a lot of times you're running the same bash script over and over and over again but you don't want one output file to overwrite the other. This is a way of producing a unique name on the, um, for the output file. And you'll notice I have what are called back quotes for the date. See that red and what's in uh, the red there, the date, plus Y, M, whatever. What's actually gonna happen is, is you're gonna, that back quote runs that command. So it's going to run the date command and it's going to come up with the date and the time in a specific format and stick it in that file name. So for those of you new to Unix or Linux, um, understanding how to use these back quotes is a, a very powerful tool. Um, moving on down, we have the module load. Uh, this is what we did. Oops, this is for the old, uh, old program. So um, I apologize for that. We're going to load modules. This will probably not work, will it? Um, so now I'm in the VI editor. What was it? Is that good enough, or do I need the? Okay. okay. Yeah. If you uh, if you change that line, uh, get rid of the the numbers. This is from an earlier version. So echo. You've seen me use echo um, several times. Uh, that just means print to the screen uh, whatever I need printed. You'll see uh, the date command in there again. I'm just saying I'm starting at this time. I've discussed environment before, the slurm environment. So these are certain slurm in, uh, environment variables every time a slurm job is run. Uh, there are certain um, environment variables that will set like the job ID. Uh, if you do the, um, the SQ where you're looking for your jobs in the queue, uh, you'll see that come up quite often. Um, the number of nodes and the tasks per node. Uh, I've explained this a couple of times. How many nodes were allocated to the job? How many tasks per node? And then uh, this environment variable slurm node list. Uh, the, these were the nodes that were allocated to the job. 
Uh, and this uh, slurm job, we're just going to do the srun command. Uh, remember that means run this command, whatever's on this command line, in this case it's bin host, run this command on each one of the tasks. So it's going to run on two nodes for uh, two copies. So what I should see is um, the host name uh, repeated twice for each node. I got the old date. So then I'm going to cd into the directory and then I'm going to run, uh, mpi run this uh, hello command. Uh, we've seen this before. This is what we were doing uh, interactively. Um, I explained earlier the dollar question mark. So what I'm doing is capturing the exit status from the MPI command, sticking it in another environment variable, and then I'm going to print that to the output. And then I'm finally going to exit uh, on what time did this job complete. Oops, and I'm still in edit mode. I'm duplicating what's already in the bash scale uh, uh, in the slurm script. It looks right. Bash key. So there I use the sq command to see um, what's in there. Notice the jump from the Turner G1, ooh, touch screen, that's cool. I can already see what nodes were uh, allocated to the job. Here's another command I find real useful. ls is to give me a list of files in the directory. Notice I put the uh, tr, disregard the ap, that's just I've done that all my life. The ltr means give me a long listing, uh, time ordered, reversed. So the last thing, the last file uh, created, oops, sorry, is that slurm. 24 out. Let's see. So as I was explaining before, um, as we go down through there, we can see, uh, where's my curse? Oh. These were the environment variables I wanted printed out. The job ID, well, expletive. Um, the host that it was going to run on, I had compute 4 and compute 5. Uh, there's our MPI error. But anyways, you can start to see um, I am no, or I am task 0 on compute, or I'm sorry. I am task zero of four, and we'll see. Notice that we got four outputs this time. Our exit status was zero, so it ran successfully, and it printed out the date that we were completed. Uh, Do I? I don't.
Now on this one, I want you to notice that I don't do the module load. Okay? So when you submit a job to Slurm, it looks at what your environment variables are in your current environment, and it copies that into the running environment. So if you're able to test things interactively and everything's working fine, and you submit it, it should just work. Okay? So um, if something seems not to work, then maybe environment variables have changed for some reason or um, uh, anyways this is just something to keep in mind that there could be a difference at runtime from uh, when you were testing it. Maybe you logged out, went to lunch, come back and then you submit the job so your environment variables had changed or something. So, uh, I don't think there's really anything different with this one. Uh, I will point out at the top, um, I didn't really point this out earlier, uh, the fourth line down, you'll notice that I put in a question, or uh, this, the hashtag exclamation point, that's to make that a comment. Uh, so there are various different um, uh, nodes and tasks that you can change here just by editing this, submit it to um, with the sbatch command and see what, uh, what changes. Uh, this is for playing on your own. And I will update this file so that you can, uh, the AAA read me, so that all of these are corrected. The CD is incorrect here. Escape. Should just work. S batch dot slurm You'll see me also using cat instead of less. Cat just scrolls everything to the the um, screen. Uh, the less command allows you to go up and down and more like an editor. A lot of people use more instead of less. The original Unix command was more. Somebody got smart, I want to do less. Notice also I did hit the tab and so I have two of these slurm-270 whatever. So it's asking me which one. I hit tab again. So, yeah, we need to get that error fixed. We were getting a different error message this morning. Yeah, I'm on the right cluster. I wonder why we're not getting that Opal uh, Common UCX. This is different than we were getting this morning. Oh, changing computers here. This morning we were getting an error that told us to put this on the 
MPI run command and it took care of the problem. We're seeing something different now. Actually, let me let me try something here. Life is an experimental science. You try things and see what happens. I did have a comment about excuse our dust. Yeah, so. So no, I do have to load the modules. Hmm. That was really the end of what I wanted to present. Uh, there's a couple of other references. This is the last slide I had prepared, but uh, if you're into t uh, containers, I know a lot of research software is passed around in containers these days. Uh, there's a couple of references here too that you may want to look at about running containers on the on the cluster. Um, other than that, I think maybe Kurt might actually do a demo on um, open on demand. This is a way of uh, actually getting uh, something like a graphical user interface into the cluster. So. Okay, this will be a very quick demo of Open On Demand. Open On Demand is produced by OSC. Um, it's open source, so anybody can tr contribute, but they're the core maintainers and they originally developed it. Um, open On Demand gives you a web interface to HPC resources. Um, log in just like you would um, to the cluster. Uh, this is on the production cluster. This isn't on um, Arc2, so you guys won't likely be able to log in here. Open On Demand is still very much in a beta status for us. Um, we're learning it. We're getting everything to work. We have a few things that um, uh, are used on it, uh, mainly just Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, we're working to get uh, MATLAB working on it, and we're going to go go from there. Um, MATLAB and R. Oh. Um, yeah, we're working to get MATLAB and R to work on it, um, are kind of the next projects for us. Um, so you can do lots of little things on here. Um, it has just a file browser. Um, you can do some simple file transfers if you need to. Um, you can do simple uh, file edits if you don't want to. Um, what can I open? We'll open this. 
if, for whatever reason, if you don't want to use terminal, you can use this. Um, it's basically the same thing as VI or Nano, just opens it in a web browser. So we'll close that. Um, if there's other file systems which we'll be adding, um, you can see I have my home directory in Scratch. Um, you can have paths to other file systems on here as well. You can see active jobs. You can filter it by your active jobs or all jobs on the cluster. Um, you can get more details on them. This is all info you can get from the command line. This just makes it a little bit more click, click here, click there. Um, and it formats it a little bit, a little bit nicer for you sometimes. Um, you can get a shell prompt, so <laughs> if you want to use a web browser to go back to shell, you can. Or maybe you do most of your work in the web browser, you can have a shell that way instead of using putty or command line or, or what have you. Um, works just the same, same way, nothing exciting there. Um, interactive apps is kind of what I mentioned, uh, where we have Jupyter Notebooks. So Jupyter Notebooks is our um, most tested uh, app here. You can see Arc Desktop. Uh, eventually, you'll be able to get a remote desktop of sorts through here. Um, and what this will, what the desktop will give you, is a, a virtual desktop on the login node. So the same thing you SSH to, uh, but it'll give you a bit more of a GUI. So you can work on it that way. You can submit jobs. You can do anything you would do normally through Terminal. Um, it just gives you a bit more of a GUI around it. Um, we'll go ahead and launch a Jupyter Notebook. Um, we're hiding a lot of parameters here because the library uses this for a workshop, so we want it super simple, but um, typically it's, it's all the sbatch commands. Um, any of those can be in here. Um, we're manually setting only one task, one core, um, and stuff like that. But we'll go ahead and click launch, and I hope we have enough room on the cluster right now to have a job. And we don't sit in queue. Okay, good. So what did this do? This had the login node um, submit a S batch for you, um, request the resources that we asked for. Uh, we were granted them. You can see we're on one node, one core. We're actually running, so that's good. We can click connect to Jupyter. Um, and then you open your Jupyter notebook like you would on, on anywhere else, um, except this is actually running on uh, Compute32. So for example, if you were normally run something on your laptop, but you're like, hey, I want to run something on 20 cores or 40 cores or what have you, or I need you know, 100 gigs of RAM or something like that, um, this gives you that advantage. Or if you want to run something for a week and you don't want to run that on your laptop, you could use something like this. Um, I don't have anything fancy, um, but just a typical hello world. And you can see it just runs the code. Um, so if anybody's familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, you probably have a little bit of an idea here of uh, where you could go from here. Um, really the, the main thing out of this is it's running on one of the compute nodes on our back end. It's not running on the login node, um, but it gets scheduled just like any other HPC job. Questions on that? Um, that's, that's the most of it. Um, there are a ton of apps um, that we're, we're trying to get on there. It's just um, trying to get through them. But it, there's huge potential for expansion. Um, all kinds of applications have already been produced to get on uh, open on demand. Uh, like I said, uh, MATLAB, ANSYS. Um, I don't know if there's any applications you guys are interested in, but um, you could search that and then look up open on demand, see if it's a possibility, um, especially for any research or classes. Um, we'd be happy to put them on our on our list to get on there. Um, I think that's it. Um, you can develop apps within open on demand, so <laughs> it's kind of interesting. You can use the open on demand browser to develop your own open on demand apps. Um, so that's kind of neat. You can then share these apps across uh, specific labs or between people or what have you. 
Um, so that's kind of a neat, neat aspect of it too. Questions? I know I blazed through that, but um, hopefully it was useful for an on-the-fly, open-on-demand. On open on demand? Yes. That's because you haven't logged into the terminal first. You have to log in through the normal SSH terminal. Yes, I am on the ERCC tool. Uh, this is only on ARCC. Yeah. But if you requested an account through us, um, currently we're creating accounts on uh, the production cluster, which is ARCC. Um, we just use ARC2 since we're, we're getting close to moving that to production uh, for the workshop. But it, it sounds like you have an ARC account, ARCC, so if you log into the uh, terminal for that, it'll create your home directory. And if not, let us know. We can come by and check it out for you. Okay. Anything else? Larry. I'm just curious um, why you all came today, what sort of code you're going to be running. Are you going to be writing your own C code or yeah, perfect. or you're going to be running R? Uh, yeah, I'll be mostly, mostly running uh, LAMPS jobs for atomic simulation. Okay, LAMPS? Yeah. Okay. Uh, probably mostly Python. That's right. Sean? Day and the Python. I'm sorry? Uh, we have a, we have a folder combines the Python and the Python. Ah, okay. Python. Uh, yeah. So we use the cluster in our lab, so we are just thinking that it means one of my lab mates uses ARCC, so I come here to that to see how we how can use it. So I'm also interested to use the Python lab, the Python notebook, and all these things, so just to create a uh, apps and I, I do work on R shiny apps. Do you yep. have the R do you have R shiny apps also can create those? Um, I'm not an R shiny expert. Is that completely separate from R Studio? Uh, it's just a module library in uh, R Studio. Okay, I know there are um, apps for R Studio. I believe I've saw I've seen um, Shiny. So it's a possibility that we can add that, yeah. yeah and what about saying, uh, can we have can we load modules into the, that we need for our program? For example, to compile C code, we need to use basically C make to compile the code. Do we have a C make on the cluster? Or yeah, wouldn't GCC give you that? Uh, if it's not, it would definitely just make a request. That's such a common tool. Yeah. They need to be on that. They probably is already there. And that's something somebody would have already asked for. Yeah. I don't know if that was part of GCC module or uh, separate. It might be a default. Right. I'm going to run Star stuff. Star CCM. Okay. Yep. We see yeah, lots of that. Yeah. A lot of that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So we have modules for lots of applications. Um, but then if you have individual applications, you can always install that on your home directory. Um, and then if it's an application that's demanded enough for several people, then we're happy to make module files for it so people don't have to install them separately. If you do have problems compiling or installing something by yourself, reach out to us and um, we're more than willing to help. Okay. Anything else, George? Nope. Thanks for done. All righty. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, George. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs>